Hi, welcome to Write More Light. My name is Sarah with the Midwest Writing Center, and I am super, super excited today to have with me um, the our selection. I'm holding it, I'm not being very subtle, uh, for the Foster Stall Chapbook series, uh, the inaugural edition. Uh, the author of this book, which is Field Notes Recovered from the Expedition to Devil's Peak, is Laura Ring. I'm going to read her bio to you so you have an idea of what you're getting yourself into watching today. Uh, Laura A. Ring's book, Field Notes Recovered from the Expedition to Devil's Peak, was selected as the inaugural winner of the Foster Stall Chapbook Competition. I'm talking really quickly. I apologize. Her poems have appeared in or are forthcoming in Rhino, Stirring, Rogue Agent, and Dream Pop, among other places. Laura holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Chicago, where she serves as librarian in charge of the Southern Asia and Anthropology collections. Her ethnography, her ethnography, Zanana, Everyday Peace in a Karachi Apartment Building was published by Indiana University Press. Laura, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. And also please correct my pronunciation on everything I just got wrong. That was all perfect, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, that's good. Thank you. Even if you're lying to me, I'm excited to be <laughs> correct. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the book. Um, I think that it is, stunning. I think that it's it's groundbreaking. Um, I feel really, really privileged to be able to to be like, yes, I am part of this this book's history. Um, that's that's such an honor. I say a lot, um, or at least I talk a big game about how I don't want to put my name or the Midwest Writing Center, as it were. Um, I don't want to put that name on something that I don't absolutely love. Um, so that should should say something, right? Either about my personal taste or the quality of, of the, the publication. Um, so this book is doing a lot of things and it's doing a lot of unique things and it's telling a really, I'm gonna stop saying the word unique. Uh, it's, it's telling a really interesting and complicated story um, so you talked a little bit in the release party on Thursday about how this, this book came to be maybe, well, I want you to talk about that, but can you maybe read the, uh, maybe, maybe read the editor's preface for us? Sure. Sure. I'd be happy to. Glad you have it on hand. I didn't ask you to have it on hand. Oh, no, I, <laughs> I will always have a copy, uh, on hand at this point. Okay, editor's preface. The 1884 expedition to Dome and Waisit, or Devil's Peak, needs little introduction. Harriet Callis, archeologist and alpinist, set off in search of the fabled burial hordes of Inyarluin, made famous by the ancient epic of the same name. Neither she nor any member of her team was ever seen again. The recovery of Callis's field notes a half century later renewed interest in the ill-fated expedition and brought with it a frenzy of new recovery missions, all to no end. In the intervening decades, the field notes themselves became the subject of wide-ranging interdisciplinary study, though reduced by time and the elements to mere fragments, their status as evidence or knowledge was controversial at best. With the textual context lost, the challenge for the editor becomes one of arrangement. Some editors have chosen to order the field notes alphabetically, e.g. Marsden, 1954, and some by size, Sheffield, 1957, with the largest intact sections first, followed by ever briefer and more enigmatic fragments of text. As one might expect, the edition published by the Royal Antiquarian Society prioritized those fragments that seemed to describe mortuary contexts, while the Royal Geographical Society favored those that lent themselves to spatial or environmental analysis. Adventure writer S. Carmichael pieced together the fragments to craft a gruesome tale of discovery and death in which Callis and her team plummet into a crevasse, only to find the very burial hordes they had sought, rendering the field notes a kind of morbid catalog of the author's own inevitable tomb. Ordering the fragments then reveals the editor's underlying pretensions, 
to evidentiality or story, narrative or science. In her 1971 sequences, published serially in the Journal of the Antiquarian Society, Ramberton, the poet R.H. considers instead what meaning may be found by placing the fragments in deliberate conversation with each other. Reception to this approach was decidedly mixed and R.H. faced accusations of indecency by the various scientific societies for aestheticizing the field notes. Unmoved, the poet responded to her critics with a single verse from the epic. Sing, beloved, your words are a marked road. Sing for the lost. In this Jubilee edition, marking the 50th anniversary of their serial publication, we present for the first time the five sequences together and unabridged. You must be, well, maybe you're not tired of reading that, um, <laughs> but it's, it's longer than I think it is because you know, um, the pages are small and you read faster in your head. Um, I'm gonna mm -hmm. hold it up. So it doesn't look long, right? I mean, it's more than one page, but still. Um, there, that's how long it is. <laughs> um, but I think it's so important. I think it's um, obvi obviously it's the first page for a reason, um, but it really sets the mood. It gets you into this like um, curious place as a reader. And yeah, I think it's really important. I also, um, maybe this is like a, a mean spoiler, um, but you in, you invented this, right? This isn't properly found poetry. It's uh, invented found poetry. That's right. Um, everything that I just read is fictitious, right? There was no such expedition. There's no such archaeologist. There's no such poet, R.H., who did this work. Although I will say that in the process of submitting it, I did get questions about whether this was real. Um, so I, I'm not unhappy about that. I, I like the idea of carrying that fiction forward, but you know, it's kind of hard to sustain it all the way through when you see my name as the author and there's no named editor and et cetera. So you can only carry that so far, but, um, but yeah, that was the intention. There's something about found stuff, right? Like found footage that even, even though you know, like your suspension of disbelief is, is peaked a little bit. Um, I went to, we talked before we went live about the book House of Leaves. I went to an event with, uh, with Daniel Lewski and someone was asking him, someone in the audience was asking him where he found, where he found the manuscript. Um, and you know, that's a very, very well-known book. That's, you know, you can look it up online. You can see <laughs> Mark Danielewski wrote this book, um, right? But it's it's presented in such a way that the the suspension of disbelief is, you know, there's a there's a thin there's a thin veil between what we understand as fiction and what our brain tells us is real. I think that's I think that you, I don't even think it's towing the line. I think you are the line there, and that's mm -hmm. uh, that's what's really cool about it. It's also spooky. Um, spooky is totally the wrong word. Haunting is the word. Um, it's just, it's really cool. Um, so beyond my praise, tell me how the book came to be. <laughs> sure. So, you know, it's interesting that, that we were just talking about how it's framed as something real, right? And that grasping whether this is fiction or not is perhaps important for the experience for the, the reader, but it actually was really important for the experience of me as the writer. Um, I'll, I'll get to some of the other ways in which uh, this project came to be in a second, but, but I think that in some ways, some of this scaffolding and even some of the critical literature that I reference, some of those things many of those things were written first before the actual poetry sequences were written. So I needed this story structure in order to be able to do what I end up doing poetically is what I'm saying. But in terms of how I came to write this, and I talked about this a little bit at the release party, which was so wonderful. 
Um, basically, I was working on another project. I was working on this prose poem series uh, titled Imaginary Mountain Ranges. And um, I'm from Vermont, but I've lived for now more than half of my life in Chicago, and I love Chicago. But I do still miss mountains, and they 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 bear a lot of emotional and <laughs> and personal weight uh, in my poems. I would say so. So this series is almost like a faux travelogue to imaginary places, and this began this project began as one of those. So I was writing notes for it. Um, just brainstorming. And the deeper I got into it, the more I, it, it felt very plot-like. And I thought to myself, well, maybe this is a short story. So I just set it aside and, and moved on to other things. And after a few months, I, I was shopping in Powell's, which is a wonderful used bookstore in Hyde Park in Chicago. And I found a copy of Anne Carson's translations of Sappho's fragments. And the title is If Not Winter. And so I bought it and I spent that entire winter break reading that book. And I had this epiphany that, well, in terms of this work that I had set aside and abandoned, what if rather than thinking of it as a short story, what if I really leaned into the idea of the fragment? Um, and so doing that, Deciding to um, lean into the fragment sort of allowed me to kind of get away from what poets will refer to as the tyranny of the sentence. And that was a, a really extraordinary experience for me. So having that scaffolding of this, this premise, this story that I set up in the editor's preface, and then having these scholars talking back and forth uh, in through the footnotes, right? It's referencing. Uh, a conversation, it's meant to be just a snippet of what is a much larger conversation, right? That allowed me to make the poems very epigrammatic and very terse and spare, right? And it could be, I could focus on language and image and um, I didn't have to focus on storytelling in, in those moments as much and in some places at all. So yeah, that's, that's how this project in a nutshell came to be. That's so, that's so interesting. Uh, the, so this question is maybe not going to be worded well. I didn't, I didn't prep this question in advance. It came, it came naturally. Um, so you say that you had, you had the opportunity to not focus on narrative in some places and let the, let the fragments do all the, all the lifting. Um, did you have like a, a big scaffolding in advance? Um, was there a lot of stripping away that you did? You know, I, I tried to do a story once I say tried because I don't think I succeeded. Um, <laughs> that, um, I mean, it was, a, it was an epistolary and I did some, some redacted bits. Like it was, it was supposed to be fun. Um, and it was about what was it, Roswell. Um, <laughs> so I had, I had a bunch of it redacted. And for me, what was hard about that was do I know what I'm redacting or not? Um, so can you can you speak to that? Like, did you did you strip a lot away? Did you do you know the full story? Is part of part of the magic of it that you don't? That is such a great question. <laughs> um, it, it really is because I think one of the the reasons I or I, I think one of the things I love about archaeology, I'm not, I do not have a background in archaeology. I have a background in cultural anthropology, although I've had exposure as, you know, it's one of the four fields of anthropology. But one of the things I love about it for this context is it itself is about uncertainty, right? Like you're always going to be trying to create a story based on very, very minimal information. And information that is subject to interpretation where the weight of the present day will matter just as much, if not a heck of a lot more than the moment that you're studying, right? The historical or prehistoric moment that you're studying. So that uncertainty is built into that discipline and, and into the very endeavor of what our fictional archeologist is doing, right? So the answer is no, I don't have a sense of what really happened. 
Um, and one of the things that I tried to do, I did try and failed in my first attempt at, at doing this. I tried to write fragments that in an elliptical way told a story. So, you know, where you write a fragment and maybe you redact it, but people can kind of read into it that that's what happened. And I, I didn't enjoy that. that. That didn't work the way that I wanted to. And that's why I, I in some ways, let some of the debate about what this could be happen in the critical apparatus, the editor's preface and the footnotes. And then I actually just wrote word lists, pages and pages, 12, 15 pages of, of words and small phrases. And I'm talking sometimes, sometimes they're that rich vocabulary from a field site, right? Like um, hearth or sieve or, you know, cloak of grass or something like that. And sometimes they're just prepositions attached to, to other words, you know, like if not, or, and then, because you need those words too. But I, I did it in such a way that you're kind of committed, right? If everything is a single word, then it's just writing. But if they're already in little phrases, you're locked in in a way. And so, and then I pieced those together. So I really gave myself the kind of constraint um, that our fictional poet R.H. would have had if she were using these. Um, although one option I had that she didn't is if I got really stuck, I would just write another page of, of fragments. Um, and that became more important when I got to some of the, especially the very last um, piece that I wrote, the last sequence, which was definitely the hardest to write. Um, <clears throat> Did you know it was going to be the last? Uh, you know, I wrote the order that you see the sequences in are the, <clears throat> the order in which I wrote them. And I wasn't sure that I would be able to do that one. Um, this one, the last one, uh, I probably, I won't read it, but I'll, I'll just explain that, you know, the fictional epic that, that I reference in the, in the editor's preface comes up because um, this is a situation where the, the expedition itself is motivated by things referenced in the, this fictional epic. And um, some of the form of the epic itself is, is in some ways mimicked by the fictional poet in piecing them together. And so the very last piece, which is called, um, it's sequence E, epitome, actually presents itself as a, an incredibly stripped down, abridged, skeletal version of the epic. So it's got four parts and the epic we learn in the footnote has four parts. And so um, the task in that one was try to, in some uh, compelling way using fragments, point towards what might be the structure and, and language and imagery of an ancient epic. So, so that one took me a very long time to write, um, but I'm glad that I did. I'm glad I, I didn't abandon that. So another um, hybrid work that I'm I'm really into. Um, I say hybrid. It's all prose, but it's just where where the content comes from is is so varying. There's no option but to call it hybrid, right? Um, it's a book called Night Rooms by Gina Nutt, um, and I I had the chance to interview her when I was reviewing her book. She was at a, a local. The, um, literary festival and um, I, I was writing it for a local magazine and I assumed based on just how complicated and how well how well the narrative flowed that it just came together that way and she told me no and I've found this a lot with a lot of writers that I get really into um, that they will literally cut up their manuscript and reorder it. So I just assumed you did that based on how many times I've been surprised to learn that that's what someone does. 
<laughs> um, so that's even like, I don't know if this matters to anyone but me, but that makes it more interesting to me that you that you wrote this in order is just mind blowing. Well, at some points, the foot I wrote the footnote first, right? So that's the way in which the order was not preserved. I would say uh -huh. for definitely for the body and for sequence A song B, I had definitely written the footnotes before I wrote the work itself. Um, that was not true for the other ones. But. That's even wilder. <laughs> I just, I want to crawl inside your brain and figure out how to do these things. Um, excuse me while I use this as a craft talk instead of an interview. <laughs> um, which, God, I would love. I would love to have you for a craft talk. Um, I don't do that yet, but maybe I should. Um, well, that would be lovely. God, that's so cool. So what's your, what's your other writing like? Is it similar? Is it um, more... I don't know, traditional poetry. You have a, another publication, right? <clears throat> An ethnography. Oh, that is an academic work. So that's a, a scholarly study um, in anthropology. Um, so that, that's academic writing. I, not really related, other than the fact that, I don't know. You wrote it. I also think a lot, I wrote it and I think a lot about writing. And I would say that cultural anthropologists think a lot about writing and about ethnography, the you know craft of writing about um, cultural worlds. Um, and I would say that ethnography is sort of novelistic in the way that I wrote it because that's what I like and I don't wanna bore myself. But as far as my other um, poetry, it's really a little bit across the map. So I have some narrative sort of lyric poetry that you could consider more familiar <laughs> or traditional. I have a lot of prose poems. I would say that that work that I mentioned, Imaginary Mountain Ranges, is also kind of hybrid in the sense of pushing the boundary between what is prose and what is poetry it sort of sounds like poetry in the way that I care a lot about sound. Um, but, but, you know, they're, they're meant to be fake entries in a, in a, in a, a travelogue. Um, I have other prose poems. I'm working on a series called Handbook of Lesser Magics, where I'm trying to put um, just these little, tiny little uh, moments in the smallest footprint that I can in prose. I have a couple of those out in the in the journal elsewhere. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of all over the map. And I, I have other experimental things that I'm thinking about and messing with. Um, I'm working on a project right now called Hunting Grounds, which is um, was inspired by finding my father's or, or finding a framed copy in my brother's house of a map that my father had drawn way back in 1970 of these hunting grounds that he used to frequent um, in Maine, which is where he's from. And there's this whole, he died when I was 21. And so there's this whole part of his life that I, I don't know anything about. And hunting is just so removed from my life and, and just anything about, you know, the world in which I, I move. So I'm doing, I have a whole bunch of odd things planned around that. And the map itself is becoming a certain kind of prompt. Um, I'm doing some field work in the realm of hunting by, via um, video games and hunting simulators, which is also going to be, I think, interesting and strange. So, so yeah, I would say I, my other writing is kind of all over the map. Both both similar and different. And I yeah. want to say, um, well, there's plenty of academic writing out there that isn't like art, uh, for lack of a better word. I don't think that that's universal. I, um, maybe, maybe this is a little annoying of me, but I'll read whatever you put in front of me. Um, and it's not all good and I don't like it all. Um, those are two separate categories, quality and, and preference. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I, of the, I think that, I think I've read two ethnographies and one is a zoologic one, which is really cool. Um, hmm. It's about um, like animals in, in mythology, right? Um, you know, I said the words and you know them, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I think that, that there, in much academic writing, in much nonfiction writing, there, there's a necessity of narration and with narration comes art. Um, I don't even like to say that like, there's textbooks and then there's nonfiction because there's a lot of beautiful textbooks out there. They're just not the ones we were given in grade school, right? <laughs> That's absolutely true. I mean, and many of the, the techniques in writing that I would bring to bear in, in my more creative prose or in poetry, I certainly used in writing the ethnography. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're an artist, whatever it is that you're creating, right? I suppose one is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but maybe not true for everyone. Not everyone's an artist, but I would say if an artist is making a non-art object, it is still an artist making the non-art object, right? Right. And it's and I think specifically, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I'm interested in in this work, in this work, is, you know, what is the nature of evidence? And, and, and how do we use that? And, and how do we understand it? And, and that certainly is something that an anthropologist has to think about when, when you're doing that sort of writing. And so some of that scholarly questioning and debate that happens in this work is definitely a continuation of, of some of those other interests. Of course, I'm not beholden to the truth in any way. And I'm liberated from that in this work. Right. I can, I don't even have to, you know, because we have no idea what Harriet Callis was writing in her journal. We don't even know if she's describing something right then. She could have been saying, oh, I remember such and such where I, whatever. Right. So like, there's so many layers in which we're removed from knowability. And it's just layers and layers of, of um, darkness that we can't, we can't see through. And that makes it really fun, <laughs> right? Uh, Whereas you have a different uh, burden of evidence and truth claims when, when you're doing, when you're writing scholarship. So. Something um, I love first that you don't personally have the full context, right? Um, but also, you know, you're, you, you remind us, we don't know we don't know anything except the fragments. And so when you have, this is, let's see, this is the footnote on the end of sequence B, the body, where you say, um, or the editor says, the words, the body alone, or as part of larger phrases appear 46 times in the recovered fragments. And then um, Philippe de, de Foix describes this horror of bodily repetition as dead weight haunting the text. But you said, you know, you mentioned we don't know the context. So like it very much could just be like, um, I have cramps today or or whatever. And and Callus is self-referring instead of my body. The body is, you know, full of cramps, for example. <laughs> um, so like a lot of it could could be very simple or or innocuous, and we just don't know, which the not knowing is, for, forgive the phrasing, I've already used it, but magical um, because you have to fill in these spaces and you don't fill them in with the innocuous. It's very cool. Right, I mean, that there is, you said that there's a spooky or a haunting sort of mood and, and that does carry through, I'd say through every single piece. And I think perhaps, if you looked at just the word lists, there are completely, there are, you, you, you could potentially, I wonder if you could, okay, I'll frame it differently. I wonder if you could take that very same 15 page word list and create a very sunshiny, <laughs> joyous, hopeful sort of picture. 
I just don't know. I mean, of course, we've set the premise up that she's never seen again. So presumably this you know, didn't that, end well. <laughs> that could, but that could be, I mean, yes, presumably disappearance means means death, right? Um, right? But that doesn't mean she died in a scary way necessarily, or like maybe not scary, probably scary if she died on this expedition, but maybe right. not in an ominous way. Right. Um, like, did she see it come? It's freaking awesome. I have nothing but praise. I wish that, um, I wish that I could stay, um, stay objective here, but I'm not going to pretend that I am, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's, I mean, that's the other cool thing about being a, a consumer of art. Like once you've consumed it, you have opinions and, and feelings and art is about the feelings and you have created them. That's how you know it's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I can ask questions. I can I can be professional. Um, there was something I wanted to actually follow up on earlier. You were discussing um, your your background and your various literary endeavors. Um, and it, it seems like they really span a wide variety. And I'm wondering, do you, do you feel that this is, you know, part of your, your creative progression has gone more into abstract or um, this project is, a a moment of your your creative work right um you know I've, you've got the the scholarly and then the the traditional poetry um some abstract and then we continue getting more abstract or these are all different projects with their own identities yeah that's a really interesting question i i'm not sure i i'm still really interested in stripping away the sentence and, and perhaps not in every poem that I write, but I do continue, I do have things that I wanna do that, that follow on from this because I've learned from this experience, right? I, I've learned what, what I can do and I'm not done with it. I'm not done experimenting um, following up on the lessons that I learned from, from writing this book. But at the same time, I don't necessarily want to do the same thing again, right? Like I read this wonderful um, interview with uh, GC Waldrop about, he was talking about this work he had done with another poet where they wrote letters to each other back and forth and that became this, this book. And so someone said to him, well, well, are you going to do more letters? And he was like, well, no, I've already done that. I already wrote that book. Now I want to do something else. And, and so I, I get that. I feel that way too. Like I want to see what's next. So some of the forms or the lessons I learned about the idea of a fragment, because the fragment is obviously bigger than this, and it doesn't have to be a fragment. You don't, you, you don't have to only use fragments when it's supported by this big scaffolding or this big um, structuring fiction, right? But I don't know, I'm always pushing, I can't remember who said this, was it Lucy Brock Brood or, or someone who said, um, strive towards um, surrealism, but you'll never arrive, right? So I, I always wanna do that. I always wanna get weirder and push more in that direction so one poet that I've, I've been reading lately is Kate Greenstreet and her stuff is just, I'd love to be able to do that. It's just a lot of um, non sequiturs that really work. You know, anyone can put in, can juxtapose things that have nothing to do with each other, but to do it in a way that is really compelling and that makes, is riveting. Right. Um, so yeah, I have a lot more work to do in, in those areas. 
I would say. And then at the same time, I still like to, to write a good kind of lyric or, you know, narrative poem that's kind of un unraveling a particular situation. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I did, um, I certainly don't mean to put, uh, to force you into boxes or like to restrict <laughs> the movement. Um, I just, because I'm so excited by or like um, awakened by uh, the innovation in, in this work, I'm curious about, you know, the, the world around it. Um, so you, you talk about your word lists um, and, and how those turned into fragments or, or didn't. Um, some, of, some of them are words alone. Some of them are strings of words. I don't know if, if phrase is really the, the word I wanna use. Um, and I feel, I feel I'll, I'll use the word fragment too much if I keep repeating it. Um, now, was that just, did you, did you have to pare that down? Um, did you just write every word you, you thought of? How did that, how did making the word list go? Well, you, had, you know, you know pages that were just. <laughs> well, I love words, right? And, and part of what I think immerses us in this work, in a space we can imagine as being part of an expedition uh, is because I, I drew from a vocabulary of archaeology, right? And I had, I had just taken this online course just for fun. This is the kind of thing I do for fun. It was on this Mesolithic um, uh, excavation at Starcar in the UK. And so this was all buzzing through my head and I, I just would write down words that I heard or or anything that um, made sense to me. I was, you know, reading about um, glacial archaeology and find that are uh, emerging as glaciers retreat. So, so different sorts of things like that, mountain and alpine environments. I, I just thought about them. I read material and I just wrote words. So I didn't put absolutely anything, but the moments where I had to push myself to just put anything was when I needed to get verbs in there. You know, and um, and things like that, and simple nouns, and etc. So there's a degree of randomness as well, and I obviously didn't begin to exhaust uh, that those lists. Many of them didn't get used, but I hope when people read it that they'll see some of the repetition of some of these fragments. Um, because that is by design, right? I thought if you're working with, if the poet were working with a body of fragments and that, and was very strict about uh, the constraint, um, you would be bound to have repetition. So there are some phrases that appear across, uh, I think as many as three poems, almost like an echo, right? So, would you be interested in reading a little bit to us? Sure, I'd be happy to read uh, another. What would you like to hear? We did the preface, and you did read. Yeah, you did read the the footnote to the preface, right? I didn't. I tend not to read that one because it. I mean, people can read that one when they read the book, <laughs> right? Um, the others are more pivotal for carrying the story forward. I'm thinking, um, yeah, why not? Um, why not just sequence A? Give a little, give a little taste. Maybe the authors. No, we don't. We've discussed the author's note. Okay, sure. Sequence A: Sombi, Staghorn, a feather covered, not yet grave. Solid, vertebral, a cloak of grass. Thus common, the original position of the body. Snowcap. 
cranium, clavicle, counted. Wool can carry bone, garments of shelter, the placement of the hands. I have seen bird shapes, half timbered, scatter into the salt. Juniper and leather, small finds, hearth and two wine bowls to be sieved, and knives too long with the city. Elm that measures of that pass, but rarely the darkness of a fixed place, of valleys red preparing. Mother, he had everything while in life, I want too many, too long. And I'll read the footnote. Sombi refers to the famous flower from the epic of Inyarluin that is seen to hasten the spirit's journey to the afterlife. While the bulk of the epic is made up of metered couplets, these are punctuated by tercets, referred to in the critical literature as Sombi cycles so named for their tendency to reference the eponymous plant. Sombi cycles are seen to foreshadow death, evoke loss, or signal close connection or kinship. Thank you so much. I think, um, I mean, we've discussed how, how visual uh, a project this is, but I think giving folks a, a taste is, is wonderful regardless. And you read it in, in such a way that I think maybe it's just me, maybe it's like a weird uh, me thing, but that, that gives a feel for it in, in a pretty tangible way. I wanna say something else too that really sets the mood of, of the book is that you call them sequences and that they're lettered. I think that's significant in a way I can't quite put my finger on, but if it said, you know, fragment one versus sequence A, that's a totally different, vibe if you'll if you'll forgive the term <laughs> sure. um is there anything that we're we're coming close on time is there any anything else you think that we should know or uh that was particularly fun or horrible or <laughs> whatever about this process uh no it was it was a wonderful process um i i really enjoyed it and and like i said i i learned a lot from doing it um, I already said that the last one in it was the hardest to write, but the other one that was hard to write was sequence B, the body, um, just because there's so much repetition in it by design. And anytime you have uh, repetition, you have to find ways to relieve that, <laughs> uh, the weight of that repetition without backing away from your intent in using it. So. So th that was the other one I would say that was the, the biggest challenge in getting it in getting it right. Um, but yeah, I can't this, imagine it any other way. The body is such a heavy, significant part of this part of this project. I it this book is so complicated that it feels natural I think and so it's it's kind of crazy talking to you about the process <laughs> um, well thank you well uh, did you have, did I interrupt you did you have more to add I'm so sorry I did not that's it um well then we can um leave folks with first I'm going to give updates on um what's up at the Midwest Writing Center tonight at St. Ambrose we have um, three affiliates of the Midwest Writing Center will be reading together in, um, in a, at, at Ambrose at the, um, Performance Center. It will be Ryan Collins, our, our director and, and fearless leader, Elena Vallejo, uh, who is an intern this summer with the Young Emerging Writers Project, and Aubrey Ryan, who's the other, um, publication from the Foster Stahl chapbook series. So it'll be really exciting. Um, it's an ongoing series of events at Ambrose collaborating with other um, arts orgs in the area. It's gonna be really cool. It's gonna be really cool reading. They're all very different writers, those three. 
Um, we have our book binding workshop coming up December 11th. That'll be an in-person class. So we are requiring uh, masks and vaccination, but it's only 20 bucks for members, 30 bucks for, for non-members to come and learn physically how to, um, how to make a book. We're gonna be learning Coptic Stitch and I'm really excited. It's, um, you can look up the, the instructor if you're interested in seeing her work. It's Andrea Jacobs. She's, uh, she was a student of the short-lived uh, book arts program at St. Ambrose and her work is very, very cool. Um, in January, we'll have Tanea Winder doing a um, femme-only heart work workshop. It'll be a series. And it's actually only $90, so very, very cheap um, looking into, I mean, all things considered. Um, she's a, a really well-known poet and, and looking into um, the, the emotional labor of writing and how to get the most out of your writing when you know, you're, a, you're a human who exists in an emotional world. Um, otherwise, we've got um, Write More Light every Tuesday and Thursday, of course. Um, we finally, finally, so excited to announce, have these interesting times. This is not a proof copy. This is the real thing. Um, we're going to be announcing lots of events surrounding this. It, um, it was a long time coming, so we had to sort of put events on hold, but now it's real and we have it and we'll be announcing lots of events for that. Um, go ahead, hit up our website, mwcqc.org to get a hold of a copy. It is $15. And I should have said, of course, Laura A. Ring. Uh, field notes. I just saw the back of the back of the book and words were there and my brain started reading them. Field notes recovered from the expedition to Devil's Peak is also available on our website mwcqc.org slash books is our bookstore. Um, this book is ten dollars. It is well worth it. I was telling Laura I already picked it up as as gifts um, for for folks I know who who like a little challenge from their from their books and like a, a lot of mystery, a lot of intrigue if if you'll if you'll allow the word it's it sounds silly now that I've said it um we are looking forward to to doing the <laughs> surrounding the foster stall chapbook series including Laura including Aubrey and um including encouraging everyone always to write more light into their lives um now before we got on this uh, live before we went live we were on the call Laura and I talked about a prompt um involving the dictionary do you want to delve into that a little bit or i can i can explain sure opinion. i mean i'll i'll just say so the third piece in here sequence c is uh called hapax legomenon which is a greek term that refers to uh when you have one a, a word that appears only once in a corpus or even in a single work and generally, this is in reference to uh, an ancient language. Uh, and when a word appears only once, it can be extremely difficult to discern what its meaning is. So in this piece, um, I've created essentially a dictionary entry where I have the, the name of the fake word. And for mine is Feldar. And then I have, I list uh, three different definitions under noun. And then I list one under adjective and two under verb. And then I have one that says archaic. And then I have uh, three as exclamation. So I thought it might be interesting for people to try something similar. You could just imagine uh, a word, make up a word, <laughs> and then imagine um, definitions for it according to those different parts of speech. And it might be especially interesting if you try to restrict the realm of those definitions to a particular kind of milieu or topic, right? So obviously mine are all coming out of essentially archeological sites or, or um, mortuary type contexts. You could think of something, something else, whatever interests you. If you're working on your own project, if you're working on um, you know, a chapbook project or a series of something, could you use that uh, universe of meaning to write, to experiment with a dictionary entry? And um, 
if that is too too open-ended for you, you don't have an ongoing project, you're just looking for a quick prompt, I would just say the object to your left. Um, as uh, as folks who, who watch these often know, um, a lot of the times I feel a little intimidated by prompts and I, I let them turn into journals, totally acceptable. I'm not gonna hang on for the five minutes here. I don't have my timer on me and um, I can smell lunch, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know that's that's selfish of me, but I do encourage everyone and I, I can I'll hold myself accountable. I'll post to our socials what I what I come up with from this prompt. Um, please give yourself five minutes on the clock and um, create a word and five definitions for it. And as always, um, Laura, an absolute pleasure. I feel so honored and humbled to hang out with you to talk about this brilliant piece. And I hope everyone out there, including you, will write more light into your lives. Thank you so much.